going to come that the invasion would occur. Um, but it turns out that the D-Day invasion at first was actually aborted. It was aborted in the beginning because of the weather. I mean, the weather was far worse than what we saw outside today. The great storm clouds had arisen. Great torrential rains covering hundreds of miles were blanketing Europe. Indeed, not only where the headquarters was for the Allied forces in Great Britain, but covering hundreds of miles as far west as where Adolf Hitler, as far east, I should say, where Adolf Hitler was falling asleep that night. So the question became for Eisenhower what to do, because it seemed virtually improbable, impossible, unlikely that they could carry out an invasion with such great storm clouds, such great winds, such terrible visibility. So Roosevelt met with his, so Roosevelt, not Roosevelt, I meant to say, Eisenhower met with his top aides. And he said, what do we do? And they all shook their heads and they said, it just seems impossible that we can carry out this invasion. So at that point, Eisenhower, he put his head to his chest, he sat down on a couch, he paced around the room, and he decided, okay, we're going to delay the invasion and we'll reconvene. And they reconvened in about 18 hours. And as they reconvened again, still it was unclear whether they could carry out this invasion. And at this point, very sadly, in a kind of low, despondent voice, Eisenhower said, I don't know how much longer we can keep this invasion hanging out on a limb. So they decided to reconvene once more. Eisenhower went back to his, his, um, his, his place of sleep. He woke up at 3 in the morning. He shaved. He briefly looked at a dime store novel. And then in this rain, he drove once again to his headquarters. And as he went to the headquarters, all of a sudden, he gets good news from the meteorologist. The meteorologist says, there will be a break in the weather. We'll have a 36-hour window in which to commence. So at this point, Eisenhower looks at his staff, and he pulls them. What do we do? Six were for, six were against. Once more, Eisenhower waited. He paused. He sat down on the couch. He paced around the room. And then eventually, in a soft voice that just rang louder and louder, he said, OK, then, let's go. We will go. And with that, cheers went up in Southwick House where they were. And at this point, the invasion was about to commence. And I want you to think about this invasion for a second. 5,000 wide-bellied ships and transport ships carrying 180,000 men. In addition to these, these 5,000 ships and 180,000 men, there would be this naval this naval and air bombardment from the sky that would be without parallel. It would be like nothing that mankind had ever witnessed before. And picture this, if you will, for a second from the Nazi side, from the German side. Commanding the German forces was the great general, Erwin Rommel. And of course, he was known as the Desert Fox from his campaigns in North Africa. And Rommel looked out, and he told his staff, he said, this war will be won or lost on the beaches. And then he said in a rueful voice, he said, this will be the longest day. Well, let's think of how that longest day began. Well, from the defenses of the German side, they were looking out over the water. And at first, they saw nothing. They just saw choppy waters. And then they saw a little bits of rain and little bits of wind. And then they saw a ship, then another ship, then tens of ships, then hundreds of ships, and then thousands of ships. And then before long, they could see nothing but ships. This great armada had commenced. And as it, amen, as it commenced, the heat and the noise were without parallel as the bombardment happened from the Allied side. It was as if, the, as if the heavens had opened up their primordial wrath. And on four beaches, on Juneau, on Gold, on Sword, on Utah, the Allies had virtually little opposition. They just steamrolled over the Germans. But on Omaha Beach, it was a very different story. The Americans were suffering ghastly casualties. It was something terrible. They were facing primordial, con constant artillery and mortar, mortar fire, and the casualties were ghastly. Shreds of flesh were floating in the water. Dead men were floating, head down in the water. Arms were bleeding in the water. Heads were blown off. Indeed, from his ship, General Omar Bradley was looking through his binoculars, and he said to himself, my god, this is a crisis of irreversible proportions. But in a miracle of miracles, as the Americans were being blown up one by one as they were losing their command officers, one by one, eventually one officer screamed out. He said, my god, men, we might as well die. We might as well die on, on, on solid land as we do 
on the beaches or in the water. And with that, the Americans, in a triumph of courage, in a triumph over adversity, they began to improvise. One by one, they began cresting the high ground. And then by 7.30 in the morning, a miracle had happened. They had seized the high ground. D-Day was going to be won. And as D-Day was going to be won, the word went out to Franklin Roosevelt in the White House. He was awakened at 3 a.m. in the morning. His hand shook as he picked up the phone. He was wearing a, a light a light yellow cardigan sweater, and he said on the phone, yes, 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 I understand, yes. In other words, what George Marshall had told him is he said, the light of battle is in our eyes, and indeed the light of battle was in their eyes. And with this, it was clear that not only was D-Day going to be won, but the fate of Hitler in the Third Reich was going to be sealed. The war was going to be won. Yet even as the empire of war for the Germans was crumbling, I want to remind you of one other thing. One thing was not crumbling, and this was the German, this was the Nazi empire of death in the gas ovens of Auschwitz. I want to remind you for a second just what Auschwitz was. Auschwitz was a death camp where people were being put into, into the gas ovens. They would be rounded up, and in fact, 175,000 Hungarians were being rounded up now. And I want to give you a sense of what that 175,000 dollar 175,000 figure represents. In Boston at the time, the population was 325,000. So it's as if you took every man, every woman, every grandfather, every grandfather, every grandmother, every child, because for Hitler it was always about the children, and doubled that population, stuck them on trains in Boston and moved them down to Washington, D.C. And once they got to Washington, D.C., every one of them would be murdered almost immediately upon cold blood. So in fact, the Jews, the travel that they had to take as they were rounded up by the Nazis or by the Gestapo is they would be put in these cattle cars, cattle cars that had little light, no water, no food, and many people would be forced to stand up for these three or four days, and they would be pleading at every stop, give me food, give me water, but none would be forthcoming. And by the time they often arrived at Auschwitz, many would be dead standing up, usually the elderly. And at one point, there was a train load of 4,000 children coming. And when the train load reached Auschwitz, the cattle cars were opened, the doors were pushed aside, and what did the Germans find? They found 4,000 children. They were all dead. They had suffocated for lack of air en route. But in other words, once they, once they got to Auschwitz, they would see these great plumes of flames 30, 30 feet to the sky. Those, of course, were the crematorium. And they smelled a smell, ghastly, like nothing anybody had ever smelled before. Little did they know that it was the smell of broiling, broiling flesh. And at one point, a little girl said to her father, she said, Daddy, will there, will there be playgrounds here, like back at home? But of course, there would not be. And another little girl knew a little bit more. She figured it out. And she said, of what use is there a God when his only duty is to punish? But as they got out of the trains, the Germans would be screaming at the top of their lungs, Rouse, 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 out, out, out. And they'd be beating the Jews with, with, with batons. There'd be barking dogs. There'd be Doberman pinchers. And then the Jews would be told to undress. They would be led into a cold room, cold and forbidding, where on the walls there were faint scratches. And the lights would flick on and the lights would flick off, on and off. And they would scream hysterically. The children would be clutching at their parents. And of course, what was happening is the Germans, sadistically, were mocking the Jews. And then eventually, gas would come out. And as gas would come out, there would be screaming. And the screaming would even eventually become a death rattle. And a death rattle would eventually become a squeak. And after 20 minutes, it would be all over. They would all be dead. And they would repeat this process, the Germans, within another hour. And then within another hour, these Jews would be nothing but ashes and dust. And let me give you a sense of the figure of the number of Jews being gassed just in each round, some 2,500. Well, that's the same amount as Pickett lost in Pickett's charge. But of course, in this case, the Jews would be gassed within 20 minutes to an hour. So the question was, is what would happen about this? What would take place? Could anything be done? Would FDR do something? Would he put a stop to the barbarism? Would he find a policy? to put an end to the carnage, especially now that D-Day was being won. Well, as it turned out, 
that Roosevelt wouldn't take the first step, but the first step would be taken by an inmate. And this is worthy of a Hollywood movie. Taken by an inmate at Auschwitz named Rudolf Berba. He was 19 years old. He was healthy. He wasn't gassed. He wasn't a slave laborer who would be worked to death within a matter of weeks. But he was a registrar, and he knew everything that was taking place at Auschwitz. He knew each train. He knew each nationality. He knew how the gas chambers work. He knew how the crematoria work. He knew what the Gestapo did. He knew what the SS did. He knew everything. And he resolved that with this potential butchery of 750,000 Hungarian Jews, the worst mass murder in all of human history, to get the word out to FDR. So with a friend of his from Slovakia, who had also survived thus far, what they did is they hid out in a woodpile. And in this woodpile, they resolved and they decided if they could make it for three days, then the internal search at Auschwitz itself would be turned off and would be turned over to the nationwide Gestapo at large in Poland and in Germany, but then maybe they would stand a chance. So when nobody was looking, they slipped into this woodpile and they waited. They waited at 5.15, the alarm did not go off. At 5.30, the alarm did not go off. At 5.45, of course, they're sitting bird-like in this little cavity of wood in their tents, they can barely breathe, they're scared. At 6 o'clock, the alarm didn't go off. And then all of a sudden at 6.15, it goes off, it screeches. And they can hear dogs barking madly, 2,000 dogs roaming all of the Auschwitz grounds. They could hear the SS madly roaming, 3,000 men turning over every floorboard, looking in every potential hiding place, trying to find them. But in fact, as it turns out, they didn't find them. The first night, as they were sitting in the cavity, they heard something really rather remarkable. They heard planes flying overhead. And Verba said to himself, he said, is this the Americans? Are they coming to help us? But they were bombing targets not far by, in fact, just five miles away. And then the second night, they heard something else. These ghastly sounds, clink, clank, clink, clank, clink, clank. These were the sounds of the crematoria working overtime, of the Jews being gassed from Treblinka. And, that, and then on the third day, the search was called off. At this point, they pushed, over, they pushed open the top of the cavity. They looked up. They saw the flames shooting 30 feet into the sky. And they turned around, and they ran. And they never looked back. And what commenced from there, and again, as I said, it's worthy of a Hollywood treatment. And in fact, Hollywood is looking at this as we speak. There was a harrowing 17-day journey. They eluded the SS. They eluded barking dogs. They eluded a, a, a sh literally a shootout. They eluded anti-Semites who would turn them in. And after 17 days, they made their way to Slovakia, where they were able to meet with these, this underground set of Jewish elders. And they recounted in vivid detail, in graphic detail, everything that took place. And the memoranda of what Verba had to say, along with his, his compatriot um, Wetzler from Slovakia, was typed up sent to the White House in a three-page memo, and then within a, it, it, remarkably, it took several months for the 30-page memo to get to the White House as well. But there was impeachable evidence of what was going to, of what was taking place. Impeachable reason, finally do something. Impeachable reason, put a stop to the barbarism. So the question was, is again now, what would happen next? For a second, I want you to think of FDR. Picture him in your mind. Remember what he was and who he was. He was the most remarkable wartime leader America had ever had, except for perhaps Abraham Lincoln. He was a man who had tamed polio, a man who had gotten reelected not once, not twice, but as I said earlier, four times. A man who, when America seemed to be in the darkest throes of depression and even seemed to be in revolution, Roosevelt, with his legendary oratory, uplifted the hearts of all Americans. He was a man whose fertile imagination encompassed so many great policies that it was out of his imagination that came the idea of Lend-Lease, the invaluable policy that kept Great Britain alive in its time of need, the invaluable policy that kept the Soviet Union fighting the Nazis on the Eastern Front in their time of need. It was out of Roosevelt's fertile imagination that came the invaluable campaign in North Africa. And this was a campaign that, of all people, Dwight Eisenhower thought was so ill-fated that when it was carried out, he said, my God, this will be the blackest day in history. 
but it was Roosevelt's fertile imagination that was right. And his campaign would give valuable seasoning to the troops and would uplift the morale of Americans and it would get them finally in the fight in a way that they could win. And it was out of the fertile imagination of Roosevelt that would come, of also of all things, the Italian campaign, the critical precursor that would take Rome out of the battle, that would take Italy out of the battle, and that would be the, the, would be the prelude to D-Day itself. And it was out of the fertile imagination as well of FDR that came the arsenal of democracy. So it seemed FDR's fertile imagination, his leadership, his vision, his wisdom encompassed everything. Everything except for one thing, the terrible barbarism taking place in the forest in the final solution of Auschwitz. And so the question was, is what would happen next? Well, as it turns out, very little was happening. And indeed, very little had been happening since 1942. In 1942, we see somebody tried to begin what Rudolf Ferber, who had escaped from Auschwitz, tried to finish. And that was Eduard Schulte. He was a German, very highly placed, a German industrialist, very highly placed within, within the Third Reich. He knew everybody. He had even met Hitler. And at one point, he had been in a meeting with, with Himmler, the architect of the Final Solution. And in this, in this meeting, it was actually a party. Men were in their finest outfits or their uniforms. Women were wearing their furs and their diamonds. And then all of a sudden, in whispers, Schulte heard Himmler talking about something, which he called the final solution, which he said was the attempt to design to systematically wipe off the face of Europe, if not the world, every single human Jew who existed. And as it happened, Schulte despised the Nazis. So he not only jeopardized his job, but his life. And he undertook a series of clandestine meetings in Switzerland with Jewish with Jewish counterparts to get the word out, to prevent what he called these giant cemeteries, to get FDR to do something. But once again, FDR did nothing. So by 1944, it turns out that one other man would step onto the stage, and it was a remarkable effort. And this was Henry Morgenthau. Henry Morgenthau was the Secretary of the Treasury. He was Roosevelt's probably best friend. They had a weekly Monday luncheon in which they discussed policies and politics and everything under the sun. And Morgenthau owed everything to Roosevelt. But he decided that he had enough of the bureaucratic foot dragging. He had enough of the government's recalcitrance about doing anything. And he couldn't stand the death of six million Jews. He felt something had to be done. So what he did was his department would write the most hard-hitting memo ever written to a president in this nation's history. And think about it. It's going to the greatest humanitarian probably America has ever seen outside of Lincoln, and that's FDR. And in this memo, it talked about the government's acquiescence in the murder of the Jews. Imagine that. The government's acquiescence in the murder of the Jews, this charge levied against Roosevelt by his own secretary of the Treasury. And Roosevelt was very shaken by this. Again, he was sick. He had this hacking cough. He had a fever. But he immediately called Morgenthau into his office. And actually, they didn't meet in the office. They met in the second floor Oval Office outside of Roosevelt's bedroom. And immediately, what Roosevelt decided to do upon Morgenthau's urging was to set up something called the War Refugee Board, the sole intent which was, to design, which was designed to help out the beleaguered Jews who were dying in one death camp after another. But the question was, is, was this too little or was it too late? And indeed, millions of cases, it was clearly too late. And then what, other, what happened at this time as well was a profound debate that took place. And the question arose, why not bomb? Why not bomb the train tracks to Auschwitz? And why not bomb the dreaded camp, the death camp of Auschwitz itself, particularly now that they knew everything about it, where it was, and what it did? Yet, as it turns out, the War Department, John McCloy, the legendary, one of the legendary wise men. He, in fact, had been responsible for the interning of the Japanese. Well, John McCloy got the proposals for bombing Auschwitz, and he said no to it. And why did he, said no? Why did he say no? Well, he said it was too far, that the planes couldn't reach, couldn't reach, reach Auschwitz, Auschwitz from their bases. But in fact, that was not true at all, because routinely for months now, American bombers have been flying over and above 
and around Auschwitz for some four months, bombing systematic targets as part of the oil war to degrade the Nazi war machine. And then it was also said, well, we can't do it by McCloy because it will divert invaluable resources. But I want you to think about this for a second, because shortly before that, it turns out in Warsaw, um, the Poles, the Polish Home Army, rose up against their Nazi masters. And in bitter fighting over a period of weeks, they did everything they could to bloody them and beat them. And Churchill was desperate at this point to, to help them out. And he pleaded with Roosevelt, let's do something. But Roosevelt didn't need much pleading because he was running for re-election and he wanted the Polish vote. But there was one other thing Roosevelt wanted to do. He wanted to help out the Polish Home Army to say, we stand shoulder to shoulder with them in their time of need. And he did this with 107 flying fortresses, which airlifted food and material and weapons to them. And he did this in spite of the fact that it was clear the Poles were going to be cut to pieces by the Germans no matter what they did. But he did it because he wanted to make that statement to the world. We stand with them in their time of need. But the question arose, if we, stand, if we stood with the Poles in their time of need, why couldn't we stand with the Jews in their time of need? And then what about Churchill? Well, Churchill, when he got the idea about bombing Auschwitz, he immediately said, this was the greatest crime that mankind has ever witnessed in the history of, of, of all recorded era, eras. And he said, bomb them and get everything out of my name if you can. But without the collaboration and the cooperation of the Americans, it never happened. And then it was also said by, by McCloy two other things. He said, if we bomb, it will lead the Germans, will lead the Nazis to be even more vindictive. Ask yourself, what could be even more vindictive than the systematic killing and the gassing of, si of six million Jews? What could be more vindictive than ripping little children from their parents and shoving them into the gas ovens? And then there is one other thing that was finally said by McCoy, that it was too difficult a mission to undertake. Well, to be sure, these missions were difficult, and accuracy was not as pinpoint or perfect as today. But shortly before the proposals for bombing Auschwitz, it turns out that the Allies bombed the Amiens prison, which was holding RAF fighter pilots. And they did it by bombing one side of the prison and the other side of the prison. And they took photos as this was happening, film as this was happening. And the photos were rather remarkable. What they showed was the blown up parts of the cruciform prison. What they showed was Germans lying in the snow, face down, bleeding. What they showed were men, RAF fighter pilots who were doomed to death rushing into the woods, rushing to their freedom. And the question became, if we can do this for them, why not for the Jews in their time of need? Well, so Auschwitz was never formally bombed. Well, actually, that's not true. It was bombed at one point, but by mistake. And as it was bombed, the SS scurried into their bomb shelters like little rats. And what did the Jews do? Think of the Jews who were still alive. They were so exhausted and worn and weary that they looked like the walking dead. They had eyes that were like sockets. They had no hair because it had fallen out. They had no teeth because they had fallen out. They could barely stand. In most cases, they could barely sit. But when they heard these bombs coming from these American planes, they looked up and they cheered. And as the great Nobel Prize winner, the great moral conscience of humanity, Elie Wiesel said, because Elie Wiesel was a young boy in Auschwitz at the time. He said, we may have feared death, but we did not fear that kind of death. But the bombing never happened. So what would happen next in the war? Well, the Germans would do what they could with their last ditch effort in the Battle of the Bulge, but it would fail. Franklin Roosevelt, of course, his health was ailing. He was sick, he was dying, and eventually his health would give out and he would die. And then weirdly, Almost strangely, it turns out Adolf Hitler would commit suicide in his bunker in Berlin at virtually the same time of day as Roosevelt would die at 3.30. And then eventually, the Germans would surrender. It would be the unconditional surrender. And when that would happen, Churchill said this was the greatest outpouring of, of joy that mankind has ever seen. And I want you to remember this scene, picture this scene of great joy, of great triumph, of great exhilaration, if you can. Whether people were in London or Paris or New York or Ankara, uh, 
wherever they were, they were dancing to celebrate this great triumph. And they said at the time, they said, long live the Allies, long live the Americans, long live FDR. This then was one of the great fruits of 1944. But there was another fruit of 1944 that I want you to think about. And this was the voices who were not heard, the voices of those who could have been helped but went to their, went to their deaths. And in some ways what I talk about here is I talk about how Roosevelt may have missed his Emancipation Proclamation moment. Remember what Abraham Lincoln did. In the throes of the Civil War, he st this war was begun over Union. It was begun in many ways over geography. And yet in 1862, after the Battle of Antietam, Abraham Lincoln, despite a great opposition in the North, despite great opposition within his party, despite even opposition within his own cabinet, he promulgated the Emancipation Proclamation. And he turned a war that was about geography into a war over human liberation, into a war for freedom, into a war for human dignity. And Roosevelt yet never quite did this. He could never quite see beyond the exigencies of winning the war itself and in his great dream of the United Nations. So what is 1944? 1944 is several intertwined stories. It is, story, is a story of great triumph. It is a story of FDR's magnificent triumph on the field of battle. It is a story of defeating one of the worst regimes in history, the Nazi Third Reich. It is a story of leadership and of FDR's decisions made. But, F, but 1944 is also another story, an intertwined parallel story. It's a story not of decisions made, but of decisions not made. It's a story of pathos. 1944 is one of the most exhilarating years the world has ever seen, but it is also one of the saddest. Thank you very much. Um, why wasn't Auschwitz, who made the decision ultimately it was McCloy not to bomb, and when do you think Roosevelt first learned about the that the extermination was beginning or occurring? Right, right. Did everybody hear the question? Yeah. Well, that's, it's, it's a great question, and it's an important question. And it was McCloy who technically made the decision not to bomb, and, and I discussed that in my talk. Um, but the question was, is did FDR know? And you know, the one thing I want to say about FDR is he was a very savvy leader. And he knew what was taking place in all his different bureaucracies at all the different levels. And at one point he had, he had said to his men about the North Africa campaign when they decided to do what they were going to do. And he said, oh, don't worry about them over there at the War Department. And at another point he talked about the Naval Department. And he said, ah, you punch it with your left, you punch it with your right, you punch it with your left, you punch it with your right. And it just comes back the same. So he was well aware of what was taking place in the bureaucracy. He had had several meetings with prominent Jews and even non-Jews in which he got the information. Remember, though, in the beginning, and when I'm talking about bombing Auschwitz, I'm not talking about bombing it in 42 or 43. I'm talking about 44. It's a very nuanced and subtle story. And that's because in 42, Adolf Hitler enshrouded the final solution in the greatest of secrecy. And it's not that he held it secret, that he wanted to exterminate and kill the Jews. He gave several speeches to that effect. But he didn't really want to formally talk about it. And I think the reason was is, A, he wasn't sure the German people as a whole would countenance such cruelty, even though I think they did know near the end. Um, but more importantly, he didn't want the Jews to resist, because it would have been much harder to exterminate them. But in 1942, Roosevelt had a meeting with a set of Jews led by Rabbi Stephen Wise, who was one of the most prominent Jews in America. And they talked about what was taking place in the slaughter at that point of some four million Jews. An astounding figure if you think about it. And what Roosevelt said was he said, I'm well aware of what you're talking about. So in other words, they may have been wrong in some of the smaller details, but they were right on the outlines. And then in 43, he met with somebody named Jan Karski, a, Pol a member of the Polish underground, who had actually seen one of the Death, not the death camps, one of the, the transit camps. It was very comparable. And, um, and he was stunned by what he saw, and he told it in great detail to Roosevelt. And evidently, Roosevelt was a little shaken up by it. 
Um, but again, nothing happened. And then, of course, in 1944, then came the, Ver the Verba memo, Verba who escaped from Auschwitz, and they knew everything. And then, of course, what they knew from Eduard Schulte, the German industrialist, well, that was at the highest reaches. I mean, you can discredit a lot of things as, as propaganda. This clearly was not propaganda. And I want to tell you one other thing. When eventually they liberated the camps, when the Americans liberated a place called Ordruf, this was a small satellite camp. This was not a Treblinka. This was not a Bergen-Belsen. It was certainly not in its level of cruelty and death and destruction in Auschwitz. But nonetheless, what they saw so horrified them, so shocked them that the legendary warrior, General Patton, when he saw, when he saw the bodies of Jews stacked like cordwood, when he saw these living remnants of human beings that there were the walking dead, he vomited. And Eisenhower, of all things, he said in 1944, he said, finally, the GI now knows not only what he's been fighting against, but what he's been fighting for. Yes, sir. Um, I have spent a lot of time in the former Soviet Union, and from their perspective, D-Day was not the decisive battle right. of the war. From their perspective, the war was won on the Eastern Front, and that's why the defenses on the Western Front were relatively thin, that you know, 20 to 25 million Soviets died on the Eastern Front, a number that does dwarf the numbers killed in Birkenau, and it is Birkenau, not Auschwitz. They're about two right. kilometers apart. So what is your perspective on the Soviet view of D-Day? Right. Well, your question is, is what is my perspective on the Soviet view of D-Day? Um, where you stand depends upon where you sit. And to be sure, the Eastern Front and what the Soviets were, were, were undergoing and the kind of fierce fighting, I mean, the fighting was primordial. It was terrible. And it went on for months and months and months. Um, it's one of the great battles of all time as well. When you look at the lists of the top battles, usually D-Day is at the top and then Stalingrad is, is second or third. Um, but to be sure, it would be wrong to minimize the amount of carnage and the heroism and the courage of the Soviets. They, they were, in effect, pulling the American chestnuts out of the fire until finally we got into the fight. Of course, the Soviet Union record in World War II is a little checkered. Let's not forget they started out on the side with the Germans until Adolf Hitler made one of his, he made two terrible decisions, Hitler. The first decision was to declare war in the United States. We hadn't entered the war. Even after the bombing of D-Day, we hadn't entered the war. But Hitler, in an act of hubris and, and just, just idiocy, I mean, there's no other way to put it, declares war in the U.S., so we immediately enter the war. And then the second thing he did is something that even in Mein Kampf he warned against. He said, never open up a second front and never fight a two-front war. And of course, he, by de de declaring war, on the Soviet Union, uh, that's exactly what he did. And again, hubris was a word. At one point, he told his assembled generals, his generals, his generals who were cowed by Hitler, and they should have known two things. Don't exterminate the Jews. Don't carry it out. And they should have known another thing. Don't wage war on the Soviet Union. But Hitler said, all we have to do is kick the door down and open it, and we'll win. He thought it would be another lightning raid, lightning strike like what happened with France but it was not. Yes, um, good, at, and good at, to see you again. Thank you. At one point, I had talked to my neighbor who lived in Hungary during the war, um, what the Holocaust was like. He was Catholic. And you know, he talked about the Jews weren't rounded up till later. And I said, but still, you're alive then. What, what did you feel like? And he said, well, they were just Jews. We never discussed World War II again. Um, the uh, question of the Soviet Union, they liberated most of the camps, right? They, they liberated Auschwitz. What was their, how did they feel about the camps? Obviously they had the Warsaw Uprising where they had done some bad things too, but were they, were they pushing to liberate the camps? Did they make it up? Uh, did they did use it as propaganda value? Was it, was it mentioned at all or was it just? When, when, when the Soviets liberated, liberated Auschwitz, um, and remember the, Western, the Allies were moving as quickly as they could from the West, but the, the Soviets were moving as quickly as they could from the East. And the Germans feared the Americans. They feared the Brits. They feared the Canadians. But boy, did they really fear the Soviets. Because the kind of battles that they had waged with the Soviets, 
where they torch things, where it was, it was just a level of carnage that was rarely ever witnessed in battle. And they thought of, this, they thought of the Jews as being subhuman bacterium, but only second to that, they thought of the Soviets as being subhuman. But they knew that the Soviets were going to exact revenge. And that's why when the Soviets were making their way into Berlin, Hitler was not going to be captured. That's why he committed suicide. Um, when, they, when they opened up Auschwitz, they took film footage of everything. They recorded everything. They logged in everything. But they didn't have the same kind of emotional reaction. And I think this is probably cultural more than anything else that the West did. When, when we liberated the camps that we did, not only did we film it, not only did we take photo, photos, not only did we make the Germans, you know, at, at Ordruf, what we did is we made the Germans walk through the camp one by one by one. And at that point, at one point, one of the Germans began laughing. And so they made them walk through again and again and again. And what happened the next day? Well, the mayor of the town and his wife committed suicide. Um, but there were two different reactions. In the West, again, as I said, Eisenhower said, now we finally know what we've been fighting for and what we've been fighting against. In the East, Stalin, no stranger to butchery himself, didn't have quite the same reaction. And interestingly enough, in one of their summits, not at the Tehran summit where they didn't discuss the Jews at all, they should have, one would have thought, that you know, this is such a great moral, tra the defining moral tragedy of our times, and they didn't discuss it at all. But at Yalta when they met, and of course at Yalta, Roosevelt was really dying. I mean, he had very little time left to live. At one point they talked about Palestine, and Roosevelt said, well, maybe we can help the Jews go to Palestine. And Stalin sort of shook his head nonchalantly and said, well, we tried to resettle the Jews, and that didn't work very well. They were much more anti-Semitic in the Soviet Union than certainly in the United States. Yes, sir. A, a follow-up. Why didn't Roosevelt do anything? You know, it's a great question. It, it, and it's, it's a question to which we don't have a clear answer. I don't, what I do more than anything else is when I wrote this book, I wanted to tell this profound, this riveting, this remarkable intertwined story of military triumph on one hand and the sadness of the Holocaust on the other, all happening at the same time, along with the dying Roosevelt. If I were to provide an explanation, and I can't say it with 100% certainty, but I think I can say it with some certainty, we know several things. We know that Roosevelt was very sick, and I think within his frail body, within his dying body, he could only encompass so much physical energy and mental energy. And his word at the time was always the following. He said, the best way to help the Jews is by winning the war as quickly as possible. But of course, as the nation put it at the time very eloquently, they said, yes, if there are any Jews left living. And the other thing that could be said is that Roosevelt had fixed on his post-war dream. And his post-war dream was that of the United Nations. And he wanted that established more than anything. And I think between his health, between his desire to win the war, and between his desire to see the United Nations, he just didn't have a space, not only within his head, but I'm, I'm, I'm sad to say this, within his heart to help out the Jews. And one other thing, I mean, Roosevelt, he was a cool and cold and calculating politician. He was a warm-hearted man, to be sure, a feast of a character. You know, every day he had his cocktail hour where he mixed the drinks, and he was a raconteur who just charmed everyone. And certainly he was, the American people looked at Roosevelt, and they thought in Roosevelt they have a friend. I mean, Roosevelt couldn't walk into a crowd, but he could reach into a crowd with his hands. And he made every American feel special. But for some odd reason, this man, this great president, this wartime leader rivaled only by Lincoln, this great humanitarian, when confronted with the defining humanitarian crisis of our times, he somehow flinched. Mm -hmm. And that remains one of history's great puzzles. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So um, I've read your book, and it's just riveting, and I would recommend it to anybody. Thank it's you. just terrific. Um, whatever happened to uh, Rudolf Verda, um, the Slovakian Jew who escaped Auschwitz? He's an amazing man. He went to Canada. 
and became a professor and lived a long and productive and fruitful life. And, you know, Verbo was really, and, and I think this is why Hollywood is looking at this. I mean, he's, he's not your average person. I mean, you got to Auschwitz, two things happened. One, you had a Nazi doctor saying, you had Nazi doctors on the platform saying, you to the right, you to the left, you to the right, you to the left. And if you went one direction, you went to the gas chambers. You were dead within an hour and a half. If you were, went to the other direction, you were a slave laborer, and you were usually dead within a matter of months. And Verba was so charming, so healthy, so resourceful. resourceful, that's the word, that he kind of knew everything and everyone, and he was like a cat with nine lives, and he used, used up every one of them. And that's why he was able to figure out a way to, I mean, he had several escape plans with other people, and every time he somehow figured out this was not the time to go, and the other people tried to escape, and they ended up dead. But Verba, thanks to Verba, we know the full story, not only of what happened in Auschwitz, but the attempt to get the word to Roosevelt, do something. And I think it's in the book where um, you relate a conversation that somebody had with Ely Roussel afterwards and asked the question, I think the question was, did Roosevelt do enough? And Wiesel said, that's a conversation for later or we... Yeah, this, this was a, I, I went to a small little dinner party, a yeah. very eclectic dinner party, and it had, of all people, Martha Stewart, Mike Wallace, the great, the great late Irish writer, Frank McCourt, and then Ellie Wiesel. And I asked Ellie about this, and he said that's a very long and involved discussion. I mean, it's something that, you know, Ellie Wiesel is one of the great moral consciences of mankind. And, he's, and he was there at Auschwitz. And he, more than any, anyone else I can think of, has borne witness to the terrible cruelties that mankind is able to wreak. And his word and his message is, is, is Auschwitz is a signal and a symbol, not only for what happened so terribly in World War II to the Jews, but it's a question of what about today when we see these terrible crises? You know, on the lips of the Americans, on the lips of the, no, on the lips of the Jews at Auschwitz, when they heard these planes flying overhead, is they always had the same sad refrain. And it's a refrain that we see today around the world when there are these crises. And it's, when will the Allies come? When will the Americans come? Yes, ma'am. I mean, there's another moral crisis that he didn't do very much about, and that's the status of the African-American troops in the war. And his wife, Eleanor, kept talking to him about these things. So do you think that there was something about the dynamic between the two of them? Because they had a very complicated relationship. Right. Um, Eleanor was, in many ways, the conscience of the administration. And, and she's very uplifting and moving and striking when you sort of see the sorts of things she tried to do. What I'd rather talk about is, is what's in my book, which is what she did about the Jews. And she badgered Roosevelt a number of times to do more. And, you know, there was this fellow named Breckenridge Long in the State Department. I didn't mention him in the talk, but he looms large in the book. And he was the head of the visa section in the State Department. And so as tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of Jews were cramming consulates all over Europe, desperate to get to freedom, desperate to get to a way where they could live, it was Breckenridge Long at the State Department who decided their fate. And Long wrote a memo a notorious memo, an infamous memo, that went out to all the consulates. And in it he said, by various administrative devices, we can postpone and postpone and postpone the granting of visas. He said it not once, but three times. And then, of course, by doing that, it was a death sentence for the Jews. Now, what did Eleanor say about Breckenridge Long? She said, my God, don't you know he's an anti-Semite? You, do you have to do something about this. And Roosevelt just looked at Eleanor and said, dear, I don't want to hear any more of that. And then she later said, when Jews in America started doing more, Jews, were, because of anti-Semitism, they were cowed. They needed a champion. They needed a voice. But eventually, in some ways, they tried to become their own voice. And this was in late 43 and early 44. And as they did that, they, they undertook all these efforts. And Roosevelt... At one, point, at one point, there were these pageants taking place, and he was invited to say something about them, about these Jewish pageants. He didn't do anything. 
But Eleanor wrote a column at the time, in her famous column, and she said the failure of the administration to do something to help the Jews was her greatest regret. So it's interesting to see the dy dynamic between the two of them. Anyone else? I think that's it. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you for coming. Folks, don't forget there's a book signing.